and welcome to each of you sharing this evening with us. I welcome those who are visiting with us and those who are the regular attenders here. It's a delight to be a part of something as significant as the coming of Christ into the world. And our evening will be scripture and music, singing as we read the scriptures. And I, I, I promise you a short message from the Word of God, not because I'm embarrassed by that, but because I want to make sure I get home before the snow. <laughs> and uh, uh, we drove from Salem, and there was no difficulty at all. I trust that it'll be the same way. Um, when we, we, the service is finished. But I trust that the service will put you in the right mood for what Christmas is all about. And I don't know of any way that is better than to begin with the reading of the scripture. John will come to read Micah, and Kathy will read Luke 1. Micah 5, 1 through 3. Now muster yourselves in troops, daughter of troops. They have laid siege against us. With a rod they will strike the judge of Israel on the cheek. But as for you, Bethlehem, Ephratah, too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you one will come forth for me to be the ruler in Israel. His times of coming forth are from long ago, from the days of eternity. Therefore, he will give them up until the time when she who is in labor has given birth. Then the remainder of his king's kingsmen will return to the sons of Israel. Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city in Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph, of the descendants of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And coming in, he said to her, Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was very perplexed at this statement and was pondering what kind of greeting this was. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and give birth to a son, and you shall name him Jesus. He will be great, and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will have no end. But Mary said to the angel, How will this be, since I am a virgin? The angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. For that reason also the Holy Child will be called the Son of God. Please pray with me. Our Father, we come to dedicate this evening to you. When the angels announced the birth of Christ, he began with God speaking to man, and then the whole story ends with man rejoicing in God. And so we pray that tonight we will have that sense that God is with us, that you are pleased when your people come together to remember the great things you have done, as Mary said. Mighty is he who has done great things. And we would tonight join her in rejoicing in you, in celebrating, remembering the, the, the event of 2,000 years ago. We thank you that in spite of the years gone by, it is still the message of the centuries and we thank you. We ask your blessing upon our evening as we commit it to you now in Jesus' name. Amen. Now you may remain seated while we sing our carols and we'll be singing O Little Town of Bethlehem and Angels We Have Heard in High. Oh, 
Christ is born of Mary and gathered all above. While mortals sleep, the angels keep their watch of wandering love. For morning stars together proclaim the holy birth and praises sing to God. How silently, how silently, the one does give his gift. So God imparts to human heart the blessings of his heaven. No ear may hear him sobbing, but in this world of sin, where big souls are him still, the dear Christ enters in. O holy child of Bethlehem, descend on us, we pray. Cast out our sins and enter in, be born in us today. We hear the Christmas angels the great glad tidings tell. Oh, come to us, abide with us, our Lord Emmanuel. In Angels we have heard on high, sweetly singing o'er the plains, and the mountains in reply echo in their joyous strain. Gloria in excelsis day. Please listen once again to the prophetic words of Isaiah from Isaiah chapter 7, 
and verses 10 to 14. Randy? Then the Lord spoke again to Ahaz, saying, Ask for a sign for yourself from the Lord your God. Make it deep as Sheol and as high as the heavens. But Ahab said, I will not ask. Not will I put the Lord to the test. Then he said, Listen now, house of David. It is too trivial a thing for you to try the patience of men that you will try the patience of my God as well. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and she will name him Emmanuel. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. And Joseph, her husband, being a righteous man and not wanting to disgrace her, planned to send her away secretly. But when he had considered this, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child who has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Now all this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall be with child and shall bear a son. And they shall call his name Emmanuel, which translated means God with us. Jesus laid down his sweet head. The stars in the sky looked down where he lay. The little Lord Jesus asleep on the hay. Be near me, Lord Jesus, I ask thee to stay. Close by me forever and love me. I pray.
And it's time now for the children's story. And Miss, oh yes, I said on my Miss Brubaker is on her way to the piano to favor us with a song. I knew there was something else I was supposed to do. <laughs> do we have any little children that would like to come up or big children? <laughs> You're looking at generations, folks. tonight called The Christmas Promise. Can you see the pages over here? <clears throat> a long, long time ago, so long that it's hard to imagine, God promised a new king. He wasn't any ordinary king like the ones we see on TV or in the books. He would be different. He would be a new king. He would be a rescuing king. He would be a forever king. And do you know what? One precious night, God kept his Christmas promise. Would you like to know how he did it? The Christmas story starts with an angel. Whoosh! He came from God to see Mary. The angel had a special message. Mary, you're going to have a baby. He'll be a special baby. God promises that your baby is going to be king. Not for a little time, but forever and ever. He will be the forever king. <laughs> Mary was going to marry Joseph, so God sent another angel. Whoosh! He came to see Joseph. The angel had a special message. Mary is going to have a very special baby, the angel said to Joseph. Her baby is going to be king, and he will rescue his people. He will be a rescuing king. God had promised that his new king would be born in a little city called Bethlehem. And that's where Mary and Joseph went. But Bethlehem was very busy with lots and lots and lots of people. So when the baby was born, he had to sleep in a manger instead of a bed. All the other mangers in Bethlehem held food for the hungry animals to munch. But this manger held a baby. He was God's special new king. Can you see him? The shepherds in the field had such a surprise. It was quiet and dark, and the sheep were sm snoozing when, whoosh, an angel popped into the sky. Now the sky was bright, and the shepherds were so, so scared, but the angel had a special message for them. Don't be afraid! I have wonderful good news for you, the angel said. 
God's chosen king has been born tonight. He is going to rescue his people just as God promised. He will be the rescuing king. Then lots and lots of other excited angels joined in to celebrate. The shepherds were really excited. They went rushing to see the new king, and there he was, lying in a manger, just as the angel had said. But they weren't the only ones who had heard the good news about the promised new king. Some wise men living far, far away had also been sent a message. It was quiet and dark, and they were watching the stars when, whoosh, a new star popped into the sky. The star had a special message. The wise men knew what it meant. A very special king had been born, the king for all God's people. This child was the promised new king. The wise men were so excited, they went a long, on a long journey to see the new king. And there he was, just as the star had shown them. Everything God promised came true. There are lots and lots of different kings in the world, but God sent the greatest king of all. He sent a new king, a rescuing king, a forever king. And do you know what this king's name is? His name is Jesus. Jesus. All right, we can go sit down with our families now. I have my Bible open to a very familiar passage of Scripture found in the book of Isaiah, chapter 9, and the famous verse 6. Isaiah 9, 6. 
one verse of scripture, but just full of information that has significance to Christmas as we think of it. Listen to Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6 as I read it, please. For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and a government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. A child will be born, a son will be given, and his name shall be. In the Bible, name is not just a designation of someone. In the Bible, name has to do with a person's character, who the person is. And I want to just pick one little phrase from Isaiah 9 for our meditation tonight. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor. Wonderful Counselor. Now, I want to read off a few names, and in your minds, perhaps you'll say, oh, yeah, I know who he is. But I guarantee you that not many of you will know some of these names, yet these are 10 famous people in the world. Listen to the name, Carl Jung. The name, um, Rollo May. The name, Abraham Maslow. Carl Rogers. I think that perhaps this one you may know because you may have heard it. Sigmund Freud. You know who those people are. How many of you know who they were? Most, yeah, most intelligent people. <laughs> because these are people that have affected us. These are world counselors. These men and women are known for what they do with human problems. And tonight, for the next few minutes, I just want to share with you a different kind of a counselor. He's called a wonderful counselor, a wonderful counselor. And the question we want to ask is, why is he wonderful? What is so special about this wonderful counselor? I want to share with you his credentials. I've chosen only two, two of his credentials. One, his knowledge of humanity. His knowledge of humanity. In John chapter 2, Christ is being confronted by his contemporaries, and they are arguing with him concerning certain things, and some believed on him. But this, the text says Jesus did not give himself over to those who were believing on him. And the question is why? Listen to what the text says in John chapter 2, verse 24. He didn't allow himself to be carried away by what they're doing because he knew what was in human beings. He knew what was in man. None of those people whose names I have written know what's in man. They knew about man. They study. They, they, okay. they study. They take years before they come to the place where they are acknowledged. But they didn't know. They haven't known up to this time. The most complex being in the universe is a human being. We, we, we're, still, we're still learning about them. I remember not too long ago, my doctor uh, went to see for my year checkup, and he asked me to take some blood out of my system, and uh, he did. The next time I went, he could tell me everything that was right or wrong with me by taking a little bit of blood from me. We have come so far in technology and science that we know a lot about man, but we don't know what is in man. This counselor knew exactly. Many believed his name. He did not respond to them. Why? Because he knows what is in man. Jesus was speaking with some people at one point in his life, and they were arguing with him 
and he said something, and this is what he said to them. Why are you reasoning the way you are? He knew what they were thinking. Now, isn't that scary? <laughs> he knew what they were thinking. Rollo May couldn't do that. They, have, they get to know us by what we say to them. But this counselor is able to go right into where we are, the secret place of where you and I live, and he's able to tell who you are and why you are. That's why he's a wonderful counselor. I, I don't want to take this too far, but, but don't you find it hard sometimes to wonder why people behave the way they do? I, I listen to the news as regularly as I can endure it. And I hear people, intelligent people, saying things. And I remember one of my professors in college used to say to us, students, don't call it common sense because it's not that common. When you, when, they, don't know what it, they don't know why people do things. One of the best physicists said this, we know what, but what really gives us the works is why. We don't know why. We know what. We can see how people behave, and we can come to conclusions from what the behaviors are, but we don't know why. This counselor does, and that's why he's wonderful. You'll see in a minute that when we come to him, he doesn't deal with the salient features of our lives. He deals with the root cause of our lives. So let's look at his fullness. The, why, the reason he's able to do this, when I say the fullness, the completeness of his being. Listen to what the scripture says. In Colossians chapter 1 and verse 9, Colossians 2, 9, it is said that in Christ, the babe that was born in Bethlehem, that was not the beginning of his existence. In Christ is all the fullness of God. I don't know about you, friends, but that does something to me. It tells me that I am far from knowing my own self. The fullness of God, that all that is God is God in Christ. L listen, who, who, how... God is like? Who has directed the Spirit of the Lord? Or who has been his counselor? Who has informed him? With whom has he consulted and who gave him understanding and who taught him the paths of justice and taught him knowledge? Nobody could teach Jesus anything because he knew everything. And what Christ knew when it is said he knows everything, it's not something that, you know, I heard the other day of a young kid, uh, I think he was 12 years old and he's getting his bachelor's from Harvard. Man, I didn't get mine until I was almost too old to get it. 12 years old. And he was going to his master's degree in physics at Harvard. Wow. But he has to learn he has to go through a process, but not so with Christ. He is, he is the one who has knowledge from way back in eternity. And in the miracle of the, 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 the manger, I guess the song that we sing today sums it up more than anything else. Mary, did you know that when you kiss the face of your baby, you're kissing the face of God? This counselor, he's wonderful because of his knowledge, because of his character. But then quickly, I want to go to the, the, the customers that he counseled. The customers he counseled. I looked at two in the Bible, more than two, but I just chose two for tonight. In, in, in uh, Luke chapter 5, verse 17 to 20, it, it's a very interesting story. It is about a man who was sick with a palsy. 
he was a he was a paralytic and and his sickness was that he was not able to control the movements of his body he he was subject to the palsy and it's a debilitating debilitating disease and his friends heard that Jesus was coming to town and they decided they wanted to take their friend to Jesus so Jesus could heal him of his paralysis and when they got to the door, I love this, it was so full of people that one of the guys had a bright idea. He said, you know what, we should go to the roof of the house, pull it apart, and drop this man right in front of Jesus. Now, I see some of you say, saying, what? Pulling the roof? Of yeah, see, in, in Israel, that's the way the houses are built. It's not the way ours are built this way. Theirs are built in flat, and sometimes you could see uh, when I was there, we could stand at one place and just look right across to see many homes that way. And they did this. And they brought this man, and they lowered this man in front of Jesus. Now remember, they brought the man to Jesus so that Jesus could heal his disease. The disease that they saw actually was affecting this man's life, his mobility, his, his, his involvement in society, he could do none of that. And when that man was dropped before Jesus, listen now, this is why Jesus is a wonderful counselor. Jesus looked at the man who was brought to him, and he said, son, your sins are forgiven you. I, I could see their faces. I didn't want the guy to get a religious something. We brought him for his physical need. You see, Jesus goes, my friends, not, he doesn't deal with the symptoms. He, he deals with the source. Now, I don't have time, but I want to read something to you. You might not know who, oh, um, <clears throat> excuse me, Hobart Mower is. In 1960, he was the head of the American Psychiatric Association. You had to be something to get that position. He taught at Harvard, and he taught at Yale. He was a Jew. He was not a Christian. He didn't profess to be one. But listen to what he said when we deal with the symptoms and not with the source. For several decades, we psychologists looked upon the whole manner, matter of sin and moral accountability as a great incubus, and acclaimed our liberation from it as an epoch-making. But at length, we have discovered that, there, that to be free in this sense, to be free from understanding why we do things, he said, is to have an excuse to being sick rather than sinful. Here's a man who lives by psychology, who did not believe in God, but he, he knew that there was something called sin. That's what Jesus dealt with. That's why he came. Before he was born, listen to, to, to what Gabriel said. You shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sin. Dear friends, I don't know if we can really have an appreciation for Christmas unless we understand why he really came. Why he really came. He came to deal with human brokenness. He came to deal with human beings' disabledness. Jesus will come to the rescue of a tax collector named Zacchaeus. He will come to the rescue of a woman whose life was so terrible that nobody would have anything to do with her. She would go to draw water from the well at noontime because if she went at that time, she wouldn't have to meet anybody else. She was an outcast. Her body was for sale. You see, Jesus deals not only with disabled people, he deals with broken people. That's why he came. 
to deal with broken people. And this woman had three great problems. When Jesus asked her for a drink of water, she responded with three unique responses that we are still doing today. One, she said, I'm a woman. Because women didn't have anything to do with men in that day, especially talking to them in public. So her gender was her problem. Aren't we dealing with that today? That's where we are. She deal with her ethnicity. I'm a Jew. I have heard some, I have heard some dumb things about ethnics. Uh, uh, I, I went, I went, I went to get, I went to get my shot, my third shot yesterday. And they had given me a, two sheets like that to fill out. And, and one of the, one question is, how would you like to be addressed? What pronoun? I, I, I almost became nasty. I, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't. Then, then the next question, I love this one. Are you Hispanic? Caucasian? Black? American? African American? And I just circled black as big as I could. <laughs> I, I am not an American, I'm not from Africa. <laughs> but this was this lady's problem. Her life revolved around who she was, how she perceived herself. And this is why Jesus is a wonderful counselor, because he helps people to be escaped from the trap they have been trapping themselves in with their background, with their ethnicity, and on and on and on it goes. Jesus said to her, go call your husband. And she said, I don't have any husband. Jesus said, you're right. You've had five she was hoping that somehow, in some relationship, she would be able to discover who she was. I always tell the story, always. I don't know why it comes to my mind. When, when Diana died, Princess Diana, of course, being from a British country, I, I spent time watching the funeral, and I will never forget what her brother said. Her brother said, and I quote, Diana has always been fighting to discover who she was. And she used many ways and things to find her, but she never did. Then he said this, I hope that in death she will find out. Friends, that's too late. That is too late. That woman did not come to realize who she was, who can help her after she died. It was before she died. And she was so liberated that when Jesus set her free from, from, from the background, from the things that, that controlled her life, she went to town and said, come see a man who told me everything I have ever done. Is not this the Christ? Oh, friends, only Christ can set you free to, to face your past triumphantly and to face your future with hope. Only Christ can do that. Unto us a child is born, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor because of his knowledge of human, human beings, his human heart, because he knew what was in man, because of his fullness, because he was indeed God revealed in the flesh, and he was able to cure human brokenness. Let me close with a song. I love this. We don't sing it anymore, but it still has validity. I heard the voice of Jesus say, Behold, I freely give the living water thirsty one, stoop down and drink and live. I came to Jesus and I drank of that life-giving stream. My thirst was quenched. My soul revived and now I live in him. He came that we might live in him. And friends, if you do not know Christ in this place tonight, the invitation is yours. 
He has come. Whoever you are, whatever the background is, I'm not going to say it doesn't matter because it does. But from the standpoint of what he can do about what really, what really is, he comes, listen to what the song says, he comes so that he can go to the deepest recesses of our being and liberate us from moral guilt, spiritual darkness, and set us living a life we never knew possible in this life. Will you pray with me? Father, thank you that this wonderful counselor has counseled many of us and all oh, some of the things he has had to see in me. But I thank you that when we come to him, he remembers that, that we are sinners, that we are broken people, that we are disabled people, but oh, what a wonderful Savior. The story read to the children tonight, he is a forever king as he is a forever Savior. And Father, I pray that this word will go with someone in this place tonight, that even when they leave, they will truly come to rest their hope in the one who was born to be our Savior, even Jesus Christ. And we pray in his name. Amen. We will come now to, um, I think, a Christmas carol. Please remain seated as you sing. One of the new carols that's making its way into our memory bank. Well, we come to that part of the service we call the candlelight service. And uh, you have been here before. You know how it is done. For parents with small children, seeing a light, they'll get excited. So we will put the responsibility on you to um, make sure that uh, we don't get into any trouble. We, we had to get, when I was in Toronto, we had to get to, um, permission from the fire department to have a candlelight service, <laughs> and, uh, just because, uh, you know, you never can tell. And so what we're going to do, um, we will light ours, and um, then the men will draw, uh, walk through, and you will light. This is symbolic. The scripture says that Jesus came and he was the light of the world. 
He came into darkness, and so the light that we are holding is symbolic of the life of Christ, which is the light of all men who trust in him. And so John and Randy, I think, please come. In the bleak midwinter, frosty wind made moan. Earth stood hard as iron, water like a stone. Snow had fallen, snow on snow, snow on snow in the bleak midwinter long ago our god heaven cannot hold him nor earth sustain Heaven and earth shall flee away when he comes to reign. In the bleak midwinter, a stable place sufficed. The Lord God Almighty, Jesus Christ. What can I give him, poor as I am? If I were a shepherd, I would bring a lamb. If I were a wise man, I would do my part. Yet what I can, I give him, give him my heart. You carry the light. I carry the light. We live in a very sad, sad world. And may we make a difference because of our faith in the Christ who loved us and gave himself for us. You're going to remain seated and you're going to sing the closing song. One that is, uh, Paul is not here tonight because he ha he's with his family in Cascadia. But if he were here, he would blast this song because this is one of his favorites. Hark the herald angels sing.
And now, our Father, we end this service with the words of the angels that first Christmas Eve night. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace with men with whom God is pleased. Send us from this place with a fresh picture of the wonder of the Counselor Jesus Christ, for we pray in his name. Amen. Thank you very much for sharing this service with us. I want to make one announcement, and that is that next, next Friday night, we are going to be showing the, the life story of C.S. Lois, which is the most reluctant believer. You will want to see that at 7 o'clock. That will be our evening, Christmas Eve, uh, for uh, New Year's Eve, I mean. And um, we will be able to enjoy an evening. I don't know if they're going to have popcorn. They usually do. I don't eat popcorn, so I don't know. But we might have something. I'll talk to those who can do magic, if you please. So thank you very much again. Please blow out your candles and give them to John.